Well, hello again. Here we are for about the uh, 12th time, I think, now that uh, I've been able to share some things with you from our little kitchen here in Yuma, Arizona. Today I want to talk to you about what it means to be propelled and to be able to continue uh, living the Christian life beyond Pentecost uh, and uh, what, uh, what takes place in our lives and what's necessary for us in order to do that. Now, in our last Bible study, uh, I actually, uh, we looked at uh, this little phrase, uh, the one and others, and discovered, uh, if you remember correctly from last time, uh, we were looking at, uh, I think, more than 90, we, I mentioned more than 90 different times that the term one another, or related words, uh, appear in the Bible and relate to over 60 different topics. And one of those words, one of those terms that uh, is used is the idea of building up one another or edifying one another. And the word for building up one another is the word orchidomeo, which basically is a construction word. It's a word that literally means a house builder. And so what I hope to be able to share with you today uh, is uh, the idea of uh, helping maybe lay some rebar or new, uh, new floor uh, joists or something that uh, helps you become stronger in your faith and in your work uh, with uh, for the Lord. Now, in the uh, in First Corinthians uh, passage of Scripture, uh, Paul makes this observation as he's talking to these Christians. He said, uh, "You know, there are gold, silver, and precious stone on the one hand, and wood, hay, and stubble on the other hand." And here's what he says in this. He says, "Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, or wood, hay, and straw," Each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. And so what we, wh whether we view things now that we, you, where you and I are living, whether we view it uh, as citizens of this world or citizens of another world kingdom, uh, the condition remains the same, same. There are things that we're facing today that, quite frankly, uh, we've never faced before, in my opinion. And whether we approach it as a patriotic citizen or whether we look at it as just a traveling pilgrim on our way through, just passing through on our way to heaven, we have to deal with some of these things, some of these issues. And the difference basically is in the source that we go to for our survival. Now, I think personally that we're under the greatest spiritual threat uh, that, we, that our country has been in and other countries too for that matter. Uh, in, in a, probably over a hundred years. And when you study history, the thing that's interesting about this is that there, there are a number of things that despotic people, despotic kingdoms, tyrants, try to do to destroy a country. But uh, there are about seven things that they try to do. Uh, they first of all try to destroy its infrastructure, that is its economy, medical services, police force, so forth and so on, transportation system. Secondly, they then also try to belittle and discredit their heroes so that uh, they become villains and evil people instead of heroes. Uh, then they also try to take control of the educational system. They try to dominate the entertainment industry. They try to control the media. Uh, they er try to eradicate its history by destroying its art and destroying monuments and rewriting and destroying or destroying history books. Uh, they'll use lies and revisions and deletions to do that. And then they will finally, the last thing they try to do is undercut, marginalize, and control its religion. Now, if you think this is not true, uh, then you need to understand a little bit about history. For example, uh, Alexander the Great, Napoleon, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Fidel Castro, Milosevic, and ISIS. They have all done this throughout all of history. This is what happens. And so for the past 90 years, I think, in our country particularly, we've seen the evidence of that to where now it's not, not only being done in a subversive way, but it's just out totally, completely out in the, in the open. And so this is the world that you and I live in as, as Christians. And, and quite honestly, this plague is far more dangerous to us, to the future of our, of, of our lives and our country, uh, than the, uh, the, the coronavirus uh, ever will be. And I think the, de the, the possibilities of de destruction are far greater uh, with this devious way of trying to undermine and trying to destroy our nation. So with that in mind, what do we do in order as Christians for us to deal with it? 
You know, I still am aware, as I've mentioned several times now, I'm still aware of how many Christians I know that are living with fear and anxiety and tentativeness and apprehension. They, they, they've allowed the circumstances to so alter and change their lifestyle that now what little lifestyle they have, it, it, they don't enjoy. Uh, and and uh, I, I, you know, obviously we have to be, uh, we have to be wise in the decisions and uh, that we make and the actions that we take, we take. But but see, the thing that's been so sad to me is to see how so many Christians, while others live victoriously and with joy in their hearts, it's as if somebody has pulled a plug, and these these people who are followers of Jesus Christ are living with fear and apprehension and sadness and sorrow and fatalism, a sense of, of futility and, fat and fatalism that, that says, well, there's nothing I can do about it. Well, there is something you can do about it. And, and basically, the thing you can do about it is decide uh, by what principles you're going to live your life. Are you going to live by the things of the world or are you going to live uh, on the basis of the promises of God's Word? And so this is what we want to do. And so in light of this, we're going to look actually at Psalm 139. Now, I've, I've taught from this uh, a lot of times. You probably have heard me. Uh, but I just, I don't have time to get into the detail on it today at all. But I do want to touch on, on something that, on this passage of Scripture. Now, you see, uh, our, our hope, obviously, well, John makes this, John, the Apostle John, he makes this observation uh, in, uh, in, in 1 John 2. He says, the world and everything in it is passing away. And so we need to understand that. One of the things that I think we Christians have a hard time with is dealing with the fact that our country, that our lifestyle, that our world system, that our form of government or our form of economy, that it's going to last forever. I'm here to tell you, it is not going to last forever. There is an end. There has been an end to every great civilization. There has been an end to great every empire, to every form of government. And quite honestly, I think Scripture is very, very clear that if we think that God, that God is going to make an exception for this human form of government, then we need to think again because there is no form of government that God has ever said he would preserve except his own. And that is a, a kingdom that is not of this world. It is a different kingdom. At the same time, we need to be willing to fight w with all we have in order to preserve the government and the country that we have, primarily because it gives us the greatest opportunity in the world of being able to share the gospel around the world. We have to find the proper balance in that. In the meantime, though, while we're dealing with that almost uh, conflict of interest, so to speak, or at least a contrast in interest, uh, what do we need to do? Well, I uh, you know, Psalm 139, as I said, I've looked, we've, we've studied this a lot of times, but I just want to, you know, we have to put our trust in God alone. There are five things that I think are found in Psalm 139 that should give you hope and encouragement if you'll simply put them into practice and recognize these five things about your God. And he is unlike any other God. And so I, I won't take time to read all of this. I can't take time to read it all. But in Psalm 139, the first thing that we see is that God is sovereign. He's sovereign. Though It starts out, and, he say, and it says this is a psalm of David. And then he makes this observation. He says, Lord. And the word for Lord there is that word that, that, that makes it very, very clear that he is, it's the word Yahweh. It's the word from which you and I get the word Jehovah. And it's basically the word that may, means that he is the sovereign name. He's the, it's the proper name of honor and sovereignty for him. And so he starts out in verse 1. So the first thing we need to understand about this whole thing, this, this challenge that we're facing, is that God is sovereign. That means uh, he has a purpose and a plan that he intends to carry out, regardless of what the circumstances are, regardless of who the players are, regardless of which political party is in control, regardless of this, that, or the other. God is sovereign. But then when you break that psalm down, you find that it actually can be divided into four different verses or stanzas. And the first, the first uh, in each of those stanzas has six verses in it. So in verses one through six, we see God as an omniscient God. Now, what does the word omniscient mean? It means basically God knows everything about everything. 
And then David goes on and he describes it. He says, Lord, you know, first of all, you know who I am. You know my character. You know I am. I mean, I, I can't pull the wool over your eyes. You know exactly who I am. You know my fears. You know my anxieties. You know my attitudes. You know my failures. You, you know everything about me. But you also not only know my uh, my character, but you also know my thoughts. You know my contemplation. You know how I think. You know, you know ahead of time, even before I think it, what I'm going to think. And so there's nothing that I can do to, to deceive you. There's nothing I can do to surprise you. But then he goes on and he says, you know, you know my contact, conduct. Uh, you know the way I'm going to, when I get up and when I go to bed, you know all about that. And you also know my conversation. You know my words before I even talk about them. And you also know my confinements. You know my limitations and my restrictions. You have established a purpose and a plan. I am who I am because of your design. And you know all of this about me. So you know my failures. You know my fears. You know my weakness. So that's the first thing we need, uh, the second thing we need to see. First of all, we need to know that God is sovereign. Secondly, we need to know that God knows everything. He's omniscient. But then the third thing we need to see in verses 7 through 12 is that we, we, we need to know God who is omnipresent. What does that mean? It means he's everywhere all the time. Now, if he knows everything about everything and he's everywhere all the time, then wherever he is, he knows everything about everything and he's always there. So there's nothing that I can, that I can deal with. In fact, David, David brings up this question. He says, where can I go? But you're not there. I mean, I can go to the highest heavens. I can go, to, which is, you know, the, the life of joy and ecstasy. Or I can go to the deepest hell. I can go to, from the east to the west. Wherever you are, wherever I am, there you are. Uh, there's no way. If I'm in a hospital bed, you're there. If I'm driving the car, you're there. If I'm sitting at a church service, you're there. You see, you, you can't get away from God's presence if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, you know, I love this, you know, Psalm 23. The Lord's my shepherd. He's my guide. He's with me. I hear his voice. Jesus talked about this in John chapter 10. He said, my sheep know my voice. They hear me and they follow me. And so wherever I am in the state of life, whether I'm going through an economic downturn or if I'm going through serious health issues or whatever the case may be, God is there. And then in verses 13 through 18, we, fe we see God is a God of omnipotence. He is all powerful. And he describes this thing, the power of, of human birth. And he describes the, the uniqueness in which while we were even in our mother's womb, we were still being shaped and formed according to God's divine purpose, not only with a physical DNA, but also with a spiritual DNA. So that when we are born, we are already pre-programmed to be the kind of people that God, want us, God wants us to be. And then in verses 19 through 24, you basically have David's reaction to all of it because he starts out and says, God, I hate those people that hate you, you know, and, 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 but after he, and he says, God, you, you know, just destroy them, get rid of them. And so we have a lot of people probably in our day that we'd love to uh, see you do some, God do something to, uh, rather than something with, and, and, and we probably need to get over that, I might add. But the one thing that we do see about this in, in the last part of those that, that particular passage, verses 23 and 24, David kind of comes to the end of himself and he says, Oh, search me, O God, and know my heart and try me and know my thoughts and see if there's any wicked way in me. And, and this points out the fifth characteristic that we see about this God uh, who will take care of us. And that is he's a God of compassion because he lists, uh, you know, he responds to prayers like David. The, the word compassion and, and the fact that God is a compassionate God uh, is, is mentioned over 20 times in the Bible. And one of them that I love is in Psalm 103 and verse 8. Listen to what it says. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He is slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. You know, And so this is the kind of God that we look on. It's somebody that we can, we can bank on, we can build our lives on. And going back to this uh, idea of, of what Paul was talking about on, on the building, you know, one of my favorite songs that I've uh, mentioned to you before is the song, uh, On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand. Uh, well, you know, I got to wondering a little bit about the story of how that, and it, it's 
it's not a very spectacular story. A, a guy in England, uh, in London, named Edward Mote, uh, he grew up sort of a street kid. He was pretty much lived a rowdy life, but came to faith in Christ as a young man. And as a, uh, as a young adult, he developed his own business. He became a carpenter and a cabinet maker. And, and one day the thought hit him, and for why, I don't know, uh, that maybe he could write a song. And so he, as he walked to work that day, uh, there were two phrases that just came to his mind. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. And that was it. Well, by the end of the week, God had given him the four verses that you and I know about. And uh, he later that week, about a week later, went to visit a minister friend of his whose wife was terminally ill. And uh, he had written those words down and stuck them in his pocket. And his, he was there uh, spending, they were looking for maybe a hymn book, hymn, hymn book that they could use to uh, maybe sing a hymn. And he remembered he had those words. And so he asked him, said, well, would you mind, uh, this is a, a new song I just wrote. Uh, could I just sing it to you? And they agreed. And uh, God really touched their, the, this lady's heart deeply. But I, I, let me just read these words to you because I think they're so important. Here's what it says. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, and all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within that veil. His oath, listen to this, his oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. And when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before his throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. And so that's the position that you and I need to remember. We need to understand that God is in control. None of this is catching him by surprise. And none of it should worry you and me. This is important for us. It's one thing to know it in our heads, but it's totally another thing to understand it experientially and to put our faith and trust in him. So let me give you about three passages of scripture that could maybe, we could call it the third point if you want to of, of my little study this morning, just some practical application. Well, the first one that we need, you see, here's the thing. When, if you're gonna to cling to a sinking ship as your survival, then you're gonna go down with a ship. And somewhere in the process, we have to be willing to stop depending on the political party or the governmental system or the economic uh, instability or whatever it else that you may be hanging on to for a sense of security and safety because none of it is going to last. And so there are three things that I just wanted to mention to you and I want to turn to this passage of scripture. Three passages of scripture for you to look at. First of all, one of them is a don't and the other Two are do's. So let me just read them to you as we kind of close things out here today. John, or 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Here's what it says. Do not, get it, do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, now this is scary. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, that's to do something, the lust of the eye, that's to have something, and the pride of life, that's to be somebody, it is not, listen, it is not from the Father, but is from the world. And here's the statement. The world is passing away 
and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of the Father lives forever. So the first thing that you and I have to do is we have to quit loving the world. And that's not as, it's not easy because we live in the world, but just because that's where we live doesn't mean we have to be dominated by it. We don't have to be dominated by greed. We don't have to be dominated by fear. We don't have to be dominated by false gods. Don't love the world and the things that are in it. So that's the first thing. Stop loving the world. Stop hanging on to stuff. Turn loose of it. And then the next thing that we look at is in Colossians chapter 3. And uh, he talks about this. And in verses 1 through 5, I'll just read this part of it. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. Why? Because you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. So, the second thing we do, first thing, stop loving the world. Second thing, start seeking things that are above. Let your values, get your priorities worked out to where the things that are more important to you are those things of God. Time in knowing Him, time in sharing Him, ability to minister to other people. Start living an unselfish life. Start living an uncluttered life. Seek the things that are above. Then the last thing that I just want to mention to you is in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Get that. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report or repute. If there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Not the virus, not the economy, not the stock market, not the president, not the Democrats or Republicans, not anything, not China, not Iran. All... Somehow or other, we need to start thinking about things that are worth thinking about. And those are the things that are true. Jesus said, you know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So things that are true, things that are honorable. Why should I waste my time thinking and focusing on things that are not honorable? Whatever thing is right, whatever thing is pure, whatever thing is lovely, think. And the word dwell, let your mind dwell, let your mind settle down and contemplate and, 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 and um, what's the word, ruminate about these things, you see. So this is what I want us to look at today, uh, is how do we live on a day-to-day -day basis without allowing our lives to be entrapped by all the worries and the cares and the anxieties that the unregenerate world has to deal with. To be quite honest with you, God is not going to be affected by who's elected in the next presidency. He's not going to be impacted by what happens on Wall Street tomorrow. He's not going to be impacted by whether or not the, the virus spikes all throughout the United States. It doesn't change. He is an unchanging God. 
He is that God who is sovereign. He's the God who is omniscient, who is omnipresent, and who is omnipotent, and most importantly, who is compassionate. And so I hope that these things will maybe encourage you today and you'll be able to uh, find joy if you've lost it. Find peace, recover peace if you've lost it. Because there's no reason for any child of God to live his life with a sense of remorse or with a sense of dullness or any other such thing. And so I hope that you will just give that some thought and uh, be blessed uh, this week as you as you do. Now, I want to do something a little different today. A lot of you talked earlier about enjoying my dad playing the piano in that one videotape that I did uh, of him a few weeks ago. And so there are a couple songs that he loved to play the piano and so I want to share those with you today. They're songs that really relate to what we've talked about today. And uh, so I want to do that. Now, keep in mind, this uh, video was basically made about 20 years ago. Uh, Dad was uh, had just turned 85 years old when he sat down at the piano and played these songs. I, I got the old-fashioned VHS video camera out, and for over an hour and a half, he sat without any music in front of him and went from one song after the other. And so uh, I hope that uh, it'll be a blessing to you uh, as you uh, finish things up today. Mm -hmm. 